it's hard to believe, uh, um, but uh, when there's a breakdown of society, the first thing that people will do sometimes are bad things. And, and this is what I want to ask Sarah next. Uh, uh, we, we talk about uh, how, you know, condom and napkins versus mineral waters and whatever else. People always think that it, that should come number two or number three. But uh, in, in conflict areas, not only are women and women bodies becomes uh, collateral damage, if I can put it that way, and systematically at that, but uh, opportunistic behaviors that goes out of comprehension but people will take advantage and and women will be looked upon as uh, people or person or group of people to be taken advantage of and this happened every time during crisis from your point of view um, I, I would say that definitely women become much more vulnerable during a crisis and rape does happen um, oftentimes rape is associated with conflict or war and mm -hmm. that's a um, misunderstanding um, I've been in situations after earthquakes or floods and have said we need to address sexual violence in the setting and people are shocked that I would even suggest it's happening mm -hmm. how can you suggest that this is happening when people have mm -hmm. been so affected yes. but it is happening that is real and it's not just in poor vulnerable communities um, for example after the earthquake in 1989 in San Francisco, okay. reports of rape went up 300%. Mm -hmm. That's a really big jump for the United States. Yes, yes. And so you can imagine in other settings this is happening as well. Mm -hmm. um, when we talk about issues like uh, rape and also about anything relating to women, for example, the, it's always being debated the role that culture and rituals play into it. And uh, to a lot of people sometimes, you know, these international aid agencies, they're so full of Westerners that they don't understand African dynamics or, or they don't understand Asian dynamics. But you are here, based in KL, so it gives you a unique pers perspective of also trying to understand this side of the world. At the same time, marrying the prerogative of the well-established uh, initiatives from the West. And then, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter whether it's uh, East or West, but what needs to be done needs to be done. Yes, exactly. Um, I think it's, it is that it is important to address this issue, and it's a sensitive p issue. A lot of times, people don't like to talk about it. Um, and one of the approaches that my agency takes is to train national and local staff mm -hmm. in these services, in this type of service provision and protection issues. So it's not just foreigners coming in and imposing this, but I mean, everywhere you go communities want to protect women yes. that's nobody mm. wants to see women raped mm. people don't want to see people getting HIV these mm. aren't contentious issues yes. um, and I think the other piece of it is that you have to listen to the communities you can't come in and say I know what's best for this community because we don't we need to engage with the people who are affected particularly the women we need to ask them what's happening with you how can we help you how can we protect you what do you need that type of dialogue does not happen very frequently and that's a big gap that's what we need to do next is really engage women themselves women and children you know two uh, main groups that suffered a lot in the past crisis and uh, but going forward in, in post crisis post disaster situations too many times the the eyes of the world got diverted away the moment things uh, return to what is deemed as normalcy you know if, if they're getting shelter if they're getting food and I mean almost done the job is there somebody else will finish up on that but these are big traumas that they have gone through if you talk about sexual and reproductive health for example and how, how would uh, society moving forward globally should and must stand up more to acknowledge this and hold out their hands more because maybe a lot of people out there have good intentions but it needs a bit of expertise to really channel it through and be specific and address the right uh, problems here. Yes, exactly. I mean, I think this really highlights the need for it, more international movements on this issue. Mm -hmm. and, and I have to highlight that there 
there has been progress made. So when I first started in this field seven or eight years ago, I would go into places and there was no concept of rape happening, people weren't addressing women's health, but things have improved um, over the past few years. So there is a movement. Um, and for example, next week we have this conference, um, the International yes. Conference for the Health and Well-Being of Displaced Women that's happening here in KL on, on the 28th and 29th. Um, and this is a very important forum that brings together all these different actors you're bringing together academics, uh, people who are working in the field, doctors and nurses, um, people who are working for non-governmental organizations to really come together and say, okay, what is the status of women's health in crisis? Where are we going? Where are the gaps? Are we listening to women enough? Are we protecting women? How can we come together and develop a strategic program that we can move forward together? Okay, I have to go for the second commercial break, but once we are back, maybe let's look at how do we discuss this? in areas which are not afflicted by conflicts and disaster. Because to get empathy of what's happening, even to discuss Darfur, it's a bit difficult because sometimes when people go on the internet, they tend to see it as uh, Muslim versus Christian or non-Muslims. And But actually on ground, the issue is more complex than that. It's about grazing land and it's about cattle and all the other factors come into play. But if you have to discuss this, and if you have to discuss this in a conference like next week's conference, for example, how do you bring about empathy? Because a lot of people who might be going there have no idea of actually what's going on on ground. So let's discuss that for civil society to rise. Sometimes we need the right tools and mechanism to open up their eyes and give them the platform to help. So we discuss that after the short break. gets underneath the skin of successful entrepreneur to find out the traits or characteristics that got him or her to where he or she is today. What I learned the most is that there is no overnight success. In any business, you've got to do it step by step. If you're passionate about something, you make it work. If you're not, you'll just, it's just a job. I think you need to develop yourself personally to understand your own capabilities. Find out if you have what it takes to be an entrepreneur. Every Monday, 9.30 p.m., only on Astro A1. 12 Disember Blockbuster Ahad membawakan filem yang diadaptasi dari sebuah novel terhebat Kisah Cinta Penedugaan Cinta Masa Namanya Kasha Dekat sini kita panggil dia Budak Setan Legenda Budak Setan 12 Disember 10 malam Tayangan Perdana di Astro Citra dalam pakej Mustika Telefon untuk melanggan. Sila ke saluran 130 untuk Pratonton Mustika. Bangsa Malaysia berhemah tinggi. Ramah dan mesra elok berkerti. Yang tiada dibantu, yang lemah dilindungi. Bertimbang rasa hormat menghormati. Budi bahasa budaya kita. Suatu Pertempuran boleh pelaku di mana saja tanpa mengira waktu. Ada insan yang sanggup meninggalkan tanah air bagi menghulurkan bantuan kemanusiaan. Ashwat dan Esro Awani merupakan antara mereka yang sanggup berdepan dengan maut. Bagi menyampaikan kebenaran kepada rakyat Malaysia. Temui Ashwat setiap hari secara langsung dengan penuh credibility. I am a journalist. I can be anywhere I want. Eksklusif di Esro.